giggle? Yes, yes. Why? I couldn't believe it, you know, three minutes. I understand it doesn't take that, but. So you know it takes two seconds to get pregnant? And it was your three minutes of fame that had gotten her there? I also found out, Your Honor, that when she left my house, she went to another man's house. Sure did. And, and the same sure thing did. happened the that same day. The plan in the Hold on to your seats, folks, because Ms. Myers just stormed into the courtroom with a list of 13 men who might be her father. The air is thick with tension and anticipation. Could today be the day she finally learns the truth about her paternity? The stakes are high and the emotions are even higher. So, uh, you have brought your mother, Ms. Madrigal, to court today because you claim she has no idea who your biological father is. You say your mother gave you a list of 13 possible men and you are hoping to determine who your father is today. The court has located two of the 13 men and has already ordered paternity tests to be administered. Ms. Madrigal. As Ms. Myers takes the stand, the courtroom falls dead silent. She reveals that from the age of 13, after her father figure died, she's been haunted by the mystery of her real father. Each name on the list, another piece of her shattered heart. Will the court deliver her from this torment? When any, any friend that she met of mine, a guy friend, she'd ask him, were they her father? Really, are you serious? So my thing yeah, is this, yeah, when, when she you, said, when, when she'll say, oh, is he my dad? I'll say, I don't know, it could be yeah. anybody in Seattle since she thinks that's what it is, yeah, absolutely. to a point it where could be you're this raised, guy right being here. raised the pawn, yeah. see? Really? See? Ms. Myers, in your statement, you say that your life without a father has been extremely difficult. Mm -hmm. Please explain. Enter Ms. Madrigal, the mother with a past as mysterious as the shadows at dusk. Admitting to her promiscuous history, she stands defensive yet seemingly remorseful. Her confession slices through the courtroom like a knife. She handed her daughter names like they were just slips of paper. Ms. Madrigal, you do admit that there were multiple partners at the time uh, that Ms. Myers was conceived? Of course, but you gotta realize I was 17. Mm -hmm. So any calculation within that time, I could have been way off and not known. Because by the time I found out, I was four months pregnant with her. You see what I'm saying? So there could be a list of whomever. It's the now timing. It's in the, the timing. The tension ratchets up as Ms. Myers recounts the pain of not knowing. With every man introduced as a potential father, her hopes rose and fell like the tides. She is a cocktail of fury and sorrow. Ms. Madrigal's eyes avoid her daughter's gaze, a clear sign of guilt. Please state how you met her. You know, we got together. She came over. She told me she thought I was sexy, whatever, good looking. My okay, bad. we had sex. It was a three minute thing. You know, <laughs> <laughs> she confirmed it. He swore to tell the truth. And nothing oh, but dude. the truth. Okay. <laughs> so how did you find out that Ms. Madrigal was pregnant? Now the courtroom watches breathlessly as the judge calls for order. The first DNA result is about to be revealed. Who among the two tested men could be the father? Ms. Myers holds her breath, her entire life story hinging on the words about to spill from the judge's lips. I wanted exactly, people but to if, see, if, if, if to he's see such if a bad guy, but if he's such a bad guy, then why would you even put him on Facebook and say, because, oh yeah, well, is he I my dad? Because I expose him of what he really but is. But you did expose so him. him. But that? you did expose him on Facebook. Father. Let's get to I don't the want facts. nothing mm -hmm. to do with him, his family, her. She done started all this problems where her family got, their, got her problems. cousins trying yeah. to fight me. Suddenly, Ms. Madrigal interrupts, her voice cracking under the weight of her confession. She says she was young, foolish, and made choices she regretted, pleading with her daughter in the court to understand her plight. But can her words sew together the tears in the fabric of their relationship? Please escort uh, Mr. Derek Smith in, and Mr. McCraney and Ms. Vernon, feel free to have a seat. Thank you. Mr. Smith, how are you today? I'm doing pretty good, Thank Judge. you for joining us. We're really glad that you could be here today, and we appreciate you submitting to the DNA testing um, because this court realizes that you are one of two men here today that we've identified that could potentially be Ms. Meyer's father. The judge looks sternly over the courtroom, calling for the first DNA result. The envelope tears open, and so too does the possibility of closure. Ms. Myers leans forward, every fiber of her being straining for the words. The room is so quiet you could hear a pin drop. Mr. Smith, you are not Monica's father. I never thought I'd have to hear that. I still love you, though. It's okay. I promise that. I'll be there for you, okay? Yeah, I promise that. Whatever you, whatever you need, I'll be there for you. I still love you. How do you feel, Ms. Meyer? Scared. Terrified right now. The judge announces the shocking result and leaves everyone stunned. A collective gasp fills the room. Ms. Meyer's face falls, a visible representation of her sinking heart. But the saga isn't over. There's still one more result to uncover. Ms. Monica, 
Monica Myers, Mr. Keith McCraney, it has been determined by this court that you are the father. There it is. <laughs> Did you faint, Mr. Whoa. McCraney? I, I, I don't believe that at all. Whoa. No, I, I don't believe that at all. They must I, have got their test mixed up. You or are the backstage. father. The impact of the revelation sends ripples through the court. Ms. Myers, overwhelmed by emotion, collapses into her seat. The two men she hoped could end her search have turned out to be another dead end. What now? Where does she go from here? I don't You're deserve none of this. Water. I didn't deserve it from the jump. I recognize that you have been a victim. I had to do it. But it's your choice myself. as to whether you continue to be one. Now, you came here for an answer. It wasn't the answer you wanted, but you got the answer. And from the way it looks, from my vantage point, you've got four people in your life right now. Ms. Madrigal reaches out, tears streaming down her face, begging for forgiveness. She is clearly choked with regret, but the damage may be too deep. Can a mother and daughter torn apart by secrets and lies ever find a way back to each other? And you've got to fix that. I'm gonna try. You've gotta find out what's appropriate and inappropriate and you gotta take heed. Are you, you understanding me? Yes, I do. All right, now going forward, it's up to you all to clean this up. Take care, I'll be checking on you. Court is a Fasten your seatbelts because Ms. Ko has just swept into the courtroom, her face set with determination and a hint of defiance. Is she really the rebellious parent her mother claims she is? Can Mr. Boyce truly be the father of her child? Today we have the case of Ko v. Ko, mother versus daughter. Uh, Ms. Ko, you say you are here today because your daughter is an out of control teenager and she needs help. Furthermore, you claim that uh, you have serious doubts uh, that your daughter's boyfriend, Mr. Boyce, Boyce is the father of your seven-month-old grandson. You say Mr. Boyce has been a good father to the baby. As Ms. Ko stands before the judge, her eyes flash with emotion. She's not just fighting for her credibility, she's fighting for her child. She declares that her mother is lying, setting the stage for a showdown that could tear the family apart or begin to mend deep wounds. She has an issue with authority. She doesn't want to be told what to do, how to do, or why to do it. Give me specific instances. Okay. From fights at school, hitting a police officer, not once, but twice. She hitting a police a, officer. She punched a police officer twice. Twice. I get the phone call to go up to the school. I get there. I was thankful. The room tenses as her mother, a stern figure, takes the stand, her voice ringing with accusation. She says her daughter is out of control. The gallery gasps as she details nights of worry, her daughter's alleged neglect, painting a portrait of chaos and carelessness. You brought drama to the house. That's not you the made kid. a phone call saying, my mother and her girlfriend just jumped on me. Y'all, you come mess them I up. I said her girlfriend just jumped on me, and I did have but somebody come true. over there. She made that phone call. Them guys, they loaded up. They came to my house. They bust out every window. They busted out my car. They, they destroyed my house. But Ms. Ko is quick to counter. She fires back that she never saw the struggles she faced, her voice cracking with the weight of unspoken stories. Her defense? A litany of efforts she's made to provide for her child. Her commitment overshadowing her youthful indiscretions. There was somebody else in the picture. So, Mom, you're saying she was sleeping with multiple guys. I know that there was someone else. Now, how many more it was, I'm not for sure. But I do know that there was someone else. So, when I find out she's pregnant, I go to the guy. I go to Larry. I say to Larry. Larry, look, as Zaire's mother, I'm going to keep it real with you. I've got to be 100. I say you need to get a DNA test. But Mr. Boy steps up, his expression one of quiet support. He says he has been there every single step of the way. Is his declaration enough to sway the court, or will the shadows of doubt cast by Ms. Ko's mother prove too pervasive? Please tell the court about that. Uh, I feel like uh, from the beginning, I knew it was a possibility, but at the same time, you know what I'm saying, he, he, made, he made me grow more, you know what I'm saying, since he's been around. Because my mom, she, she passed away. And once I told her about it, you know what I'm saying, she just, oh, that's my grandbaby. She, she buying him everything, I'm like, So oh. your mom? She passed away in February. Charges of bad parenting fly like arrows, each one aimed with deadly precision at Ms. Ko's heart. Her mother accuses her of not being there when her father needed her, recounting missed birthdays and absent holidays. The sting of each missed milestone hangs heavy in the air. You looking at pictures of you as a child and him as a child. That's I can see son. in your eyes you love him. I'm really, really proud of you. I really am. I Thank want you to know that. And you know who else is? Oh. Your mom. She is. 
and as you know, as much of a stand-up man, you know, you're being in this decision. Ms. Ko's defense is passionate, her tears genuine. She says she has made mistakes, but who hasn't? But she has grown, learned, and her child is her world. Her heartfelt words resonate, but the skepticism in her mother's eyes remains unmoved. The safe, the sex you had was safe sex. Yes. It wasn't. And the defendant. I know it wasn't, because the first time, even when you wasn't under the influence, you didn't use it. Was you drunk? What about the first time? Was you drunk? What about the first time? Was you drunk? No. Okay, the first time, that was something else. Did you use one? No. The second time? No. The third time? No, he didn't use. I use calm. Not with I, me. Yes, I did. <laughs> the debate intensifies, the air crackling with raw emotion, accusations, defenses. The judge calls for order, but the underlying issues are too tangled, too charged with past hurts to settle quietly. The courtroom becomes a battlefield of conflicting narratives. Ms. Cole, right. but you have told this court that you think it could possibly be Mr. Boyce or maybe someone else. Okay, let's go to the results, okay? Jerome, do you have the results? Here you go, Your Honor. Then the pivotal moment arrives. DNA results are in hand. The court falls silent, the tension palpable. Ms. Co grips the edge of the witness stand, bracing for the news that could either validate her claims or upend her world. Mr. Boyce? You are not the father. Yes, you are. You're his father. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, you are. I'm still his father. You okay? I know this was not the way probably any of you. In the wake of the revelation, Ms. Ko's mother's face softens, a glimmer of regret passing through her eyes. She wonders if maybe she pushed too hard and the reality of her daughter's struggles becomes painfully clear. I know it's hard to accept, but if you can hear me now and potentially just think about this in weeks and years to come, that families are more than just biological connections. They are love connections. Prepare yourselves as Ms. Williams and her sisters confront their mother, Ms. Liddell, in a courtroom filled with electric tension. They question their paternity, fueled by years of doubt and betrayal. Is Ms. Little hiding the truth about their fathers? You are here today with your two sisters. You all claim she wasn't a good mother and say her promiscuous behavior is the reason. Ms. Liddell, you admit you haven't been the best mother, but you say your daughters are being unfair. Ms. Williams steps forward, her voice steady but filled with a mix of hope and despair. She accuses her mother of never telling them the whole truth, her sisters nodding in agreement beside her. Their mother, Ms. Liddell, looks back with a gaze that mixes defiance and regret, the courtroom bracing for impact. Tell me about the paternity issues. It was this man who was supposedly had been my father. We were all wanting to know, like his family, my aunt that raised me and Jasmine, we wanted the paternity sex. Ms. Little admits her past was marred by mistakes. She confesses she wasn't the mother they needed, her voice breaking. The gallery is silent, hanging on every word, but her admission does little to soothe the years of pain etched onto her daughter's faces. <laughs> is my daddy when you look at him but you tell that's your daddy i was never there for them i give him that i think the best thing that i did was to give them to family because if they would stay with me either they'll be <laughs> separated or away from no, us she didn't take a chance to try to raise us i was in five different homes the atmosphere intensifies as ms williams recounts tales of a childhood filled with uncertainty and whispers she says her mother laughed it off told them to pick any man from the street how can a mother say such things well, the courtroom is left shocked. Mr. William, we're here with um, Lisa, Jasmine, and Jamie, and we're talking about the circumstances regarding their paternity. Do you believe you are their father? Ms. Little tries to explain, her words stumbling over decades of regret. She thought it was better to joke than to admit she didn't know, attempting to shield herself from the glaring truth of her failures. But her words only fan the flames of resentment. What? Why did it take 20 years? This is the man that you were told was your father. Correct. Yes. Now he's expressed that he doesn't truly believe he's your father. Right. Yes, ma'am. Tempers flare as Ms. Williams and her sisters demand answers. Who is their father? Why hide the truth? Ms. Little shrinks back, the weight of her past pressing down upon her. Each question is a strike, each plea a reminder of what was lost. You were out, you were able to come. Why, why did you miss it? Jamie, because I was a piece of 
to be like, I'm not gonna keep, I'm not gonna keep down on myself, but I didn't care about y'all. I'm keeping it real. Y'all want me to keep it real? I didn't care about y'all. The judge intervenes, calling for calm, but the emotional turmoil simmers. This isn't just a paternity case. It's a battle for closure, for healing. Ms. Little's next words could either bridge the gap or widen it forever. Okay. She I gotta finally get away from her. tells the truth and you yelling over it. Excuse me, she just, wait a minute, because I, I need them to understand this. In a moment of raw vulnerability, Ms. Little makes a painful admission. She says she gave the suggestion to abort, referring to a dark moment meant to stay hidden. The courtroom gasps. Such a confession is both a revelation and a blade to her daughter's hearts. But you have to accept life as it comes. The cards that are dealt to you, right? Yes, we yeah. have. Right. That's we why we're just moving on our life. That's why exactly. we just want to Exactly. And that's and what I want to help you do to today in this courtroom by giving you these results. As the judge prepares to call for the results, the courtroom holds its breath. Will the truth free them from their past, or will it anchor them deeper into despair? The air is thick with anticipation, each heart beating in sync with the ticking clock. Mr. Williams, you are not her father. Thank you, James, for what you did for me. Thank you. I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. Mr. Williams, I see that this was emotional for you as well. You you thought out of all of the girls. Mr. Rajat and his partner take center stage in a courtroom drama that's charged with accusations and bitter regrets. Once a picture-perfect couple, they now face off over unsettling truths that could unravel everything they've built. Mr. Rajot, you claim your wife had an affair while you were away and then got pregnant shortly after you returned home. You argue you have no idea if her child is yours. You have petitioned the court for the results of a paternity test and a lie detector test to discover the truth. Mr. Rajat stands, his voice steady yet tinged with pain as he recounts the early days of joy and laughter with his partner. He asserts they were happy, casting a longing glance at her. The room feels the weight of past memories, now overshadowed by current strife and dissatisfaction. Tell me why you have the concerns. You know, uh, all of my family and her family all have brown hair and brown eyes, and this child has blonde hair and blue eyes. His partner standing firm, voices her grievances. She says everything changed after their child was born, her words cutting through the still air. She speaks of neglect, of a love that dimmed as her body changed, her pain palpable and raw in the silence that follows. Never talk to a guy, nothing inappropriate. I've spoken to a man, yes, but I have never cheated on my husband. I've never had any sexual con- nothing. That's and a lie. Why are you so sure, Mr. Rajo, that she's cheated? On you. Accusations fly as she confronts Mr. Rajat about his wandering eyes, claiming he flirted shamelessly with her own family members. She demands to know the truth, her betrayal written large on her face. The courtroom murmurs the scandal of the accusations, adding fuel to the fire of their public ordeal. How's that? We went, you out, stayed to, out, we went night. out to dinner. You thank you. Anyway, we went I out to dinner. Your phone over and over. We went you out, stayed out to all dinner. Night that night. We all went night. out to dinner. To the next morning, I but I get did not do anything because, unlike you, I. I love my husband and I've been faithful. And there's no harm in having dinner with a friend. Was this a person you've been intimate with in the past? Mr. Rajat retorts, his tone defensive yet remorseful. He said he was seeking what he felt was missing at home, his excuse sounding feeble even to his own ears. The complexity of their issues deepens, the roots tangled in a web of unmet needs and unspoken words. I'd actually heard from the event today, I went out to a bar that, that night and uh, she had been kissing on another girl, so. What I do is my business and he gets to twisted and that tries to act like just because she wants to be a dirty nasty hoe don't mean I have to be one. You said in your statement to the court that actually Mr. Rajot has been the person. But there's more. She recounts moments when she felt most vulnerable post-pregnancy, her body a stranger to her and seemingly to Mr. Rajot too. He looked through her as if she were invisible and her vulnerability turned into anger as she spoke. At one point you love this woman very much. Yes, Your Honor, that's correct. Uh, my eyes on her that she was gonna be the person I was gonna then be Then why with. have you always cheated on me? Because you do the same thing. He's a liar. What? He hits on them all day long. Mr. Rajat looks down, shame clouding his features. He admits he struggled with change, his voice barely a whisper. The admission does little to soothe the raw edges of their fractured relationship, the courtroom a witness to their unraveling. You think he 
he cheated with a family member. I do. I never do that, Your Honor. Yeah, I do uh, know you better than that. That's too thick, why. Too thick and That's thin. why we've there's always another been situation. There through, through the rough edges, we've always ended up that, to. You have betrayed her in other ways, but you're saying you would not betray her in that way. Never. We get back on the rough edges because I forgive his life. As they stand facing the remnants of their shared life, the judge offers a path forward. Consider counseling, not just for you, but for your child, she suggests, her wisdom echoing in the hushed courtroom. Will they take the offered hand, or is the chasm too wide? Mr. Rajot, you are her father. Oh! What are you feeling right now? I'm just mad because he has denied our child for so long. And I knew, because I'm not nasty. I I've been faithful to this man since I met him, and he can't say the same. <laughs>